This is going to be a fun video. I'm going to show you how to generate fractals in MATLAB. All the code in this video works in Octave exactly as it works here in MATLAB. However, I find that Octave is not as optimized as MATLAB, so the code will run significantly slower. When we get to the section that's actually generating the fractals themselves, we're talking about a speed difference that is very noticeable, like 30 seconds in Octave is nearly instantaneous in MATLAB. But Octave users, if you are patient, it will work for you. All right, one of the web sources that I used for this code is right here. So consider checking that out. It's got some information on complex numbers, and there's some more sources at the bottom of this document, main.m. As with all the files in all these videos, there's going to be links to the code in the video description. I'll also include links to my sources here and the sources at the very bottom. But before we jump into fractals, I need to tell you about complex numbers. So let's run this first section here. So a complex number is a number with two parts, a real portion and a real number multiplied by an imaginary number, multiplied by the square root of negative one. Now MATLAB asks us for some reason to not use i as the imaginary number, but to use one i. So you won't see that in the document I uploaded, but maybe make that change and that warning will go away. You can also generate the exact same complex number using the built-in complex function. And there are built-in functions real and imag that can extract out just the real or just the imaginary coefficient of a complex number. So you can see all my results over here. The imaginary part was off the page slightly because of the large font size that I'm using. And we also need to understand the complex plane. How do we graph complex numbers? It's actually quite easy. Let me scroll down to this next section and run it. All right, two figures popped up here. And if you look carefully at these figures and compare them, you will notice that they are practically identical, except one of them is indicating a point with a star and the other is indicating a point with a circle. And that's the only difference. So in the first figure, figure one right here, I created a complex number, three plus two i. In the previous example, I used three minus two i. In this one, I'm using positive two. It doesn't make a huge difference, but that is a slight change that I made. Then I use the regular old plot function to plot the real component as x and the imaginary component as y, and I use a marker of star. And that's the first figure. And then the second figure, I just plot the complex number, z. I don't separate out the parts. I don't put in more than one input for like x and y values, just z by itself. And MATLAB knows to graph the real part along the x-axis or the horizontal axis and the imaginary part along the vertical or y-axis. And that's just how we typically graph complex numbers. We treat the complex number as having two parts, which it does. And the real part goes on the horizontal axis, imaginary part goes on the vertical. That's gonna be important to understand when we get into the fractals. All right, here's a little bit more plotting just to re-emphasize my point here. All right, so I've got a vector z of four complex numbers, three plus two i, negative two plus one i, negative two minus one i, and one minus two i. And when I plot z as a vector with circles, here are the points that show up. I did change my axis a little bit because if I don't do that, like the edge of the graph is right on all these numbers and I think it's harder to read. But as you can see here, here is zero on the x-axis and here is zero on the y-axis. And all four of these numbers can be located with their two components. Take, well, we already did three plus two i, so let's do a negative two, negative one. So we go left two, down one, and there it is right there. And then just for fun, I have this next section right here where I generate real numbers between zero and four pi, and then I generate a vector of complex numbers using my t vector multiplied by e raised to the t times i, or the complex number zero plus ti. So I run this section and I get a spiral and I think that's kind of cool. But that's just another just for fun graph that I threw on there. Let's continue on down. All right, finally we're going to get into the fractal itself and we're going to be looking at the Mandelbrot fractal. This fractal is a visual representation of the following question. If I square a complex number and add that resulting number to the original complex number repeatedly, how many times do I have to repeat that process before the result escapes the radius two circle centered at the origin on the complex plane. Now that's a bit much to digest, so let's take it apart in pieces. Let's look at a simpler example first. Imagine I'm just in the real numbers, and I'm only in one dimension. I just have a number line. 
I take a number on the real number line and I square it. Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? Well, this is actually quite easy because it only depends on is the number smaller than one or bigger than one, and correspondingly negative one as well, right? So if your number has a larger magnitude than one or negative one and you square it, well, then it has an increasingly large magnitude. Two squared is four, for example. If the number is exactly one and you square it or negative one, well, it stays as one. It stays the same magnitude. But if the number is less than one and we square it, then it gets smaller. But what happens when complex numbers are squared? Well, it's a little bit trickier. So here I'm displaying uh, the square of a complex number, and it's hard to display out over here because my screen is such large font size, but 0.75 and 1i is what I get. And I got that by sort of foiling out, that's just an acronym to remember how to multiply a binomial times itself, first, outer, inner, last. And if I do that to this complex number, this is what I get, and then I'll combine like terms, and I'll rearrange a little bit, and this is what I'll get right here. Now this number is further away from the origin than the original number. And maybe that's obvious to you in foresight, and maybe it's not. I don't think it's that obvious, and here's the tricky part. We look at this original number, and we don't see any negative signs. Now sure, if we wrote out instead of i, square root of negative 1, then we'd see a negative sign in there, but the coefficients are both positive. However, when we square it, because we are squaring i, it's possible for a negative sign to jump out. In fact, guaranteed that a negative sign will jump out or pop out of that square root. And that means that complex numbers, which have positive coefficients, when we square them, could potentially then have negative coefficients. Now this one does not, but we could imagine a case where one does. And in fact, I don't think it would be that hard to construct. All right, so I just made the coefficient on i a very large positive number and square it, and bam, now this is very negative, right? So that wasn't that hard. Now, when we're asking which number is closer to the origin, this number or this number, it's relatively easy to see because, I mean, this is 1 and a 0 0.5 for coefficients, and this is a 1 and 0 0.75. So obviously this one is further away. But if we are in doubt, we can simply use our regular distance formula, or if you prefer, Pythagorean theorem, looking at the square root of the horizontal distance squared plus the vertical distance squared. And so here I'm generating a, another different complex number, and I'm going to show you a comparison between these two calculations. And that comparison is they're exactly the same. Now, don't get confused by this yet. I'm going to explain that in a second. But convince yourself right here that this is a distance formula, a distance from the origin for these two coordinates, like as if this were x and this were y. So x squared plus y squared, the square root of that, that's the length of your hypotenuse on a right triangle, right? That is a distance. Now, how come the absolute value of a complex number gives the exact same result? Weird. Actually, not that weird. The absolute value in one dimension is a distance function. What is the distance of 4 from 0? Well, it's distance 4. What's the distance of negative 4 from 0? Well, it's distance Four. Absolute value is actually the distance function in one dimension, and so the implementers of MATLAB decided that the absolute value should also be used as a distance function for complex numbers, and I think that that makes a ton of sense. So that's just something to let you know. You don't have to write out all this. You can just take the absolute value of a complex number and get its distance from zero, from the origin, I should say. All right, let's just look at a little bit more complex arithmetic squaring right here. Okay, so I take my complex number from the previous section, I square it. That is the exact same thing as simply foiling out the components. So here I'm just multiplying out the terms of the complex number. Don't forget the imaginary number on the middle term here. Or just writing it out like this, which is the same thing, it's just not foiled. And I get the same result for all three. Just kind of emphasizing, hey, reminding you, what does it look like to square a binomial? Okay, I'm going to skim past this text here. Feel free to go back and read it if you like. Let's run our fractal and talk through it. All right, there we go. And I did not speed up the video there. That's how fast it took with MATLAB. I'm not kidding. It takes me around like 30 seconds to generate this image in Octave. So unfortunately, it is a lot slower, but the code does work. 
So what we have here is actually the complex plane. The x-axis, the real axis, goes right down the center here. And the y-axis, the imaginary axis, is this vertical line right here. And then here's what we do. For every single pixel, we look at that pixel as the coordinates and what complex number that would represent, right? So if we go to the right and up, we'll have a positive coefficient on the real component and a positive on the imaginary. If we go left and up, we'd have negative coefficient on the real and positive on the imaginary, and so on. So each of the pixels represents a particular complex number. And then the algorithm that we run goes like this. Square that number and add it to the original and get its distance from the origin. If it's bigger than two, stop. Make that pixel dark. And the darker the pixel, the quicker it went beyond that distance two. Otherwise, keep repeating the process. Square your resulting number, add it to the original. Square your resulting number, add it to the original. And at some point, you have to give up. And if at that point, the number is still less than distance two from the origin, color it white. So the white pixels here are basically values that stayed close to the origin, and the darker pixels are values that went away from the origin when we, we ran this algorithm. And what's so cool about this is, this is a great visual representation of chaos theory. If you've heard anything about chaos theory, you've probably heard the butterfly effect. And the story or idea of the butterfly effect is simply that a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the earth, and that causes or leads to a hurricane on the other side of the earth that would not have occurred if the butterfly would not have flapped its wings. That's a little weird, but it illustrates a really good point about chaos theory, and that is that the technical term for it is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and we can see that with our fractal right here. Let me zoom in. This point, let's say it's white, I'm not sure, it might just be a very pale shade of gray, like, or this point right here, whatever, right? It looks like a white point surrounded by darker pixels. That point right there, when we run this procedure, doesn't get very far away from the origin. But the points right around it, in every direction, do. They escape from the radius 2 event horizon, if you like. And that means that if we changed the value of that pixel slightly, and of course the values all around it are basically representing slight changes to it, we get a wildly different result. And that's what it means to have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Sensitive, a very, very small change, dependence, will affect the outcome, initial conditions. So the, the change is made to that very starting point, and we get a very different outcome in the end. Let's look at the get fractal function. But first, what are we passing to it, and what are we getting back? So here I'm generating a matrix of zeros, 800 rows, 800 columns. I'm passing that to the function, I'm getting an 800 by 800 matrix back, and I'm using the imshow function to display it as an image. By the way, any matrix, imshow can display it as an image, and we'll see more about that in the next video. All right, so let's look at get fractal, and as always, links to all these files are in the video description. All right, now what get fractal does is it takes the canvas there, it does have this number here choosing how many iterations of our algorithm are we going to go before we give up. You can make this larger and you'll get more precision, but the algorithm will run slower. Octave users, I recommend going in and editing this right away down to a smaller number, 10, maybe even 5. We're going to ask, okay, how many rows and columns are there in our image? Make a copy of the canvas. I'm not sure this is strictly necessary, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then get two vectors. Get vectors of x values and y values. Because we don't want to go from 0 to 800, even though in my input that's how many like rows and columns there are. We want to go on that negative 2 to 2 circle around the origin. So from negative 2 to 2, get a rows number of evenly spaced values. Same thing for the columns. Loop across the row indexes. Loop across the column indexes. And then generate a complex number. The real part is from the x vector. The imaginary part is from the y vector, multiplied, of course, by the imaginary number. And then pass that complex number and the maximum number of iterations, in this case 30, which I chose somewhat arbitrarily, to this new function called complex count. I also wrote this one, so we'll check that out in a second. But for now, I'm just going to tell you complex count is going to return a positive integer. It's going to return some number between 1 
and max iterations. And that number is showing how many iterations of the algorithm did it take for the number to get beyond distance 2, if it ever did. And if it doesn't, well then it'll just return 30. Finally, we'll take that value, divide it by 30, so now we've got a number between 0 and 1, and we'll put that value into our result matrix, which IM show can then interpret as a value between white and black, a pixel value on the screen between 0 and 1. I think 0 is white and 1 is black, but don't quote me on that. We could print it out and see, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. All right, let's look at the complex count function, which is also available in the video description. All right, here it is. So it takes in a complex number and a maximum number of iterations. It's got its own variable. This is the value it's going to return, iterations. That's going to count up how many times the loop went around. It keeps a copy of the original complex number, which is important because that's part of the calculation. And then as long as the absolute value of the complex number is less than 2, and we haven't reached the maximum number of iterations, then loop. And this is the calculation that I've been telling you about. Take the original number, add the square of the complex number, and that's our new number. And then repeat that process, adding in the original to the square of this complex number. Increase the count of how many iterations have elapsed, and that's what we return. And that's it. That's how to generate our image here. Cool. Now let's do a comparison. So I mentioned earlier, if I'm in one dimension and I square that number, it's really easy to tell if the result is bigger or smaller than the original. But what if we do the exact same process that I used to generate that fractal, but I do it with real numbers? Okay, so this code right here is exactly identical to this code right here. I'm just calling a different function. And let's look at that function, get real right here. The get real function is exactly identical to the get fractal function with one difference. This right here, right? So this is the get fractal function with that imaginary number multiplied right there. Here's the get real. The only difference, I mean, other than the function name, is that we don't have that imaginary number multiplied right here. Otherwise, it is completely identical. And what's the graph look like? Well, it looks like a stripe, a diagonal stripe. It's very boring. It's very easy to predict whether your starting number is going to uh, go beyond above the radius two circle around the origin or not. And so this is not very interesting. I just wanted to contrast that because it's the imaginary number that's really adding in all these interesting features. And now for funsies, let's look at a version of the fractal with color and see how I did it. All right, here's my version with color. I challenge and encourage you to do a better job than I did. I'm not super happy with this. Um, but I wanted to move on to other things, so I didn't, I didn't work to improve it, although I did do a little bit of work. It does have lots of colors. If I zoom in here, you can see blue, green, red, pink, uh, yellow, and so on, but it's kind of all grungy. I don't know. I don't like the color scheme. This is not what I was going for, but let me show you how I did it nonetheless. So this is in the function get fractal color, and it's very similar to the code that I did before with some small adjustments. First of all, I have a color list, and I grabbed this color list from this web page right here. And basically, every pixel has a red, green, and blue component, or at least it can. In the previous example, we were just using grayscale. So this means 100% red, green, and blue all mixed together. This means 100% red and green, and zero blue. This one is all red. This one is all green, and this one is all blue. You get the idea. Now we do need to create a three-dimensional matrix. Go back and review the three-dimensional video if you uh, need to, a reminder of how to do that. But we do need a three-dimensional matrix in order to display in color. One of the dimensions is red, the first one. Second one is green, third one is blue. This part of the code is exactly the same as before, as is this actually. And I have sort of two different ways of doing this, but here's my like smoother way. I like this even less than the way I'm doing it here. Basically what I did was I still have the complex count function. I'm using that same function and it returns an integer, right? And what I was doing up here or trying to do was just whatever integer gets returned between zero and the maximum, I just index with that number into the color list. And so I'm using the length of color list uh, minus one as my maximum value into that complex count. My max iteration count is what I'm using that as. But I modified it here where I'm multiplying by five gradations so that every color comes in five shades. Um, but I think I didn't do it very well because I'm pretty sure every single color comes in black. 
um, which is not quite what I wanted. Also, like, the shades of yellow that are dark don't look very good, in my opinion. Anyway, this didn't quite work out the way I wanted. I bet you can do a better job, and so I challenge you to do that. But that's roughly how I did it. No changes were made to complex count. It's the same version as before, but uh, I do need three dimensions, so you may need to review that code. Let's look at another color version. I call this my Get Fractal Color Smooth here. So this one I like a little bit more, but it's still not really what I was going for. So let me show you how I did this. Um, again, at this point, I'm really just playing around. So this is available in the function get fractal color smooth. Let me open that up. And this is very similar to the previous example with a three-dimensional vector for the colors. And then all I did was I call complex count three times. One for the red, one for the green, and one for the blue. And I just have some like really arbitrary calculations. For example, I square the red. That's it. I square it. I only have uh, 10 gradations of red, so I divide that one by 10. Uh, I have 20 of green and 30 of blue. And for the blue, I invert it. So I, I raise it to the negative one power as long as it's not zero. That's an important check to get right there. Um, so I'm just basically doing some arbitrary calculations on these three values just to see what pops out. And you should feel free to play around with it and see what evocative color schemes you could get with the fractal. I like this next one right here. So this next example right here, the get fractal zoom, allows me to zoom in on a particular part of the fractal. So I don't have to go from negative two to two in both the real and imaginary axes. In fact, I have these variables right here to specify what is the left border or the minimum real component, minimum horizontal, and what is the right border, the maximum horizontal. Same with the vertical, the imaginary component. And with get fractal zoom, I just pass in my canvas like with before, and then the four other variables. Let me run this section, then we'll look at the code. So for this, I've zoomed in on a part of the fractals toward the upper right. And this is a really nice way that you can see sort of more fine-grained detail without slowing down the algorithm a whole bunch. And I just think this looks so cool. All right, so let's look at get fractal zoom. And a lot of the difference in the calculation has to go right in here, where I generate the x and y coordinates, right? Instead of just going from negative 2 to 2, I go from left border to right border and from bottom border to top border. And pretty much everything else is the same, in fact. So it was actually really easy to do this. I will just make one note. Um, this right here is a range of 0 0.5, and this is also a range of 0 0.5. I don't think it looks as good to use a different distance on one axis compared to the other. So for example, if I make this negative one, so this distance is 1.5 as opposed to 0.5 here, um, it stretches the image. So you can see how it's stretched vertically here. And I just think that doesn't look as good. So for example, I put this to negative two, um, then, well, at least it's framed properly, right? The dimensions, the, same, the distance along the horizontal is the same as the distance along the vertical, even though it's maybe not the best frame to look at the fractal through. So anyway, that's just some details on that. And lastly, here is a totally different fractal. Let's check it out and then we'll discuss. All right, so this is a fractal from the Julia set. So it's got an interesting fidget spinner sort of shape there. And there's a slight difference right off the bat. So my canvas is the same. I just used 800 by 800. You could use whatever dimensions you want. And I've got this complex number, 0 0.28 minus 0.6i. That's kind of arbitrary. And it is. It's very arbitrary. Our function is get Julia fractal. It takes the canvas's input and the complex constant. And then there's just one little difference in how this is calculated compared with the previous, the Mandelbrot set. So let's open up the function itself. Now I do actually have two functions in this one file. I don't recommend that my students do this, but you can do it. Its usefulness here is that I wanted to organize some code into a separate function, but this function is never called anywhere other than from this function up here. And for me, that's the best use case for why you might define two functions in a single file. But I tell my students to avoid this because it can get you into trouble if you do it wrong. So this aspect, the get Julia fractal, is almost identical, except the complex constant input here is passed to this complex count function, this one right down here. And what the complex count function does with it, the only difference between this and the, the other version of complex count that I've got is right here. Instead of adding the squared complex number to the original, 
we add every single complex number to this constant that gets defined here. And so one thing that we can do then is if I change this complex constant, I can get a slightly different fractal. So here's the one that I've got right now. And in fact, I'm going to change this. So I just use figure and just generate a new one. And then we can compare and contrast. And I'm going to change this 0.28 to 0 0.3 and the 0.6 to 0.55. So very small changes. And this is what the new one looks like. So there's the old one on the left and the new one on the right. And you can see they're kind of related. This one on the right just looks like thicker. And you can play around and also make other changes to these numbers. Now, if you make a dramatic change, for example, just 2 instead of 0 0.3, you might get something, well, it's mostly black here. I don't know if your screen can even show, but like there is a little bit of pale gray up here and down here, but mostly that just doesn't work great. So smaller changes are going to be better. I actually had a student one time who wrote some code that looped through a variety of values and generated all the images and then output them in sequence, or maybe they used like a GIF generator to put them into a GIF and showed like uh, the fractal mutating through those different values or evolving through those different values. And it was a really cool and evocative uh, uh, generation of imagery that they had there. So that's a pretty neat thing. You can probably find stuff like that online, but it's also like just a really neat exercise that you could consider trying. And that's all I got for the fractals. I really enjoy this stuff. Hopefully you did too. Here's a little bit more information on it right here that I'll include, of course, in this file that is uploaded and also in the video description. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to blur an image or just generally manipulate an image. And then the video after that, I'm going to show you how to manipulate audio data as well in MATLAB and in Octave. When I'm not teaching, I write science fiction. I have one book out called Crew of Exiles. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and as an audiobook. If you've enjoyed or benefited from this series of MATLAB and Octave videos, and you'd like to show your appreciation, well, if you yourself enjoy science fiction or you know someone who does, please consider buying a copy of Crew of Exiles. I'll provide some links to it in the video description and a comment below. If that's too much to ask, well, a like on this and the other videos is also always appreciated.